Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, one and all. That's better, isn't it? It's great to see you here this morning. Um, welcome to regulars and visitors alike. It's lovely to see uh, Philip and Betty's family here this morning. I hope you feel very welcome and uh, uh, at peace amongst us today. Welcome also to those who are online, both uh, those watching us live and, um, and those, I guess, on catch-up as well. 
Um, I hope you feel part of our service together this morning as well. Our, our subject this morning is, is one of unity and uh, we're looking partly at the body of Christ and uh, what it means to be family and church together. So uh, I, I hope that uh, you get a sense of being part of our service with us this morning as well. As you can see, the um, communion table is laid and uh, there'll be a short communion service after our main service this morning. I'm sure Andrew will explain a bit more about how that will work as, uh, as when the time comes. Right, um, let's just start with some words of scripture, if I may, this morning. This is uh, a few verses from Romans chapter 12. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Let's pray this morning, shall we? Lord, we come into your presence, aware of your holiness, but drawn to you by your gentleness. We have come because we have heard of your mercy, and we come bringing our sinfulness. We come confessing that sin this morning, but also that you are creator. We are aware of our need of your recreation in our lives. We come declaring your sovereignty and majesty and ready to offer thanksgiving and glory. We come knowing that you are our judge, but trusting your mercy and the grace of Christ. We come because you are worthy of our worship and our commitment. We come because you've called us we come because in you we have life, hope and eternal life. So we gather this morning to worship you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We are going to sing. Our first song this morning is uh, Speak, O Lord. It's uh, a good song to just focus us on our worship this morning, to remind us that uh, as we come into his presence, we gather to worship and we, we gather to meet with uh, the living Lord Jesus today. We invite him to take his truth and plant it deep in us as we worship together.
So our, um, our worship this morning is focused on, on our theme. It's, it's unity and maturity that Andrew is going to be speaking to us on later from uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And that theme of unity is one I've tried to weave into uh, the worship and the songs that we're singing this morning. We're going to have a, a short video clip in just a moment that also explores a little bit about what it means uh, to be united as a body and as a family in Christ. And the theme of maturity and unity go very closely together. It's, it's hard to have unity unless we have a mature approach to our faith. This is a little video that just explores, I don't know, it's easy isn't it sometimes to feel a bit of righteous indignation when we're right and someone else is wrong. Um, but it takes maturity sometimes to lay some of that feeling aside in order to achieve um, unity for the sake of Christ and for the sake of our witness in the world. So um, let's watch this together, shall we? Um, so I hope we are uh, we're ready to be challenged a little bit this morning in our thoughts and our attitudes. Um, I enjoyed that and uh, some of the thoughts in it that uh, we find level ground at the foot of the cross where we all stand even, don't we, when we come to Jesus. Let's, um, can I have the offering? Do you think, Sue, would that be all right if you bring the offering forward? We'll just pray. I'll wander over here if that's okay. Great, thank you. We're going to uh, just pray as we receive this. <coughs> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these gifts and for many others that are given in so many different ways to the life of this church. We thank you too for the signs of the Spirit's presence and his activity in our lives, changing our attitudes, reshaping our thoughts and transforming our desires. 
Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you have poured into our lives. You long to use them and us for the building up of the life of your church, enabling us to declare your love and your witness to the truth. We praise you that though we are very different people with different backgrounds, different hopes and different fears, your love and your spirit make us one. We thank you for every member and every person's contribution to the life, worship, mission and ministry of your church. For the assurance that our life together now is simply a small sample of the joy and peace that we will share together in Christ for all eternity. We thank you for each other and for our fellowship in the Spirit. May all that we say and do as your church enable others to know the joys of sins forgiven and the promise of eternal life in Christ. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing again. And we're going to get brave this morning. I don't know whether you're feeling particularly brave, but uh, the worship group have got to be brave anyway, because we're trying a new one. So you might not know this, but hopefully you'll be able to pick it up. It's, um, you're, you're looking at the words and thinking, I certainly do know this, John. Um, this is an old hymn, but it has been uh, reset to music by Keith Getty with a little bit of chorus added to it. Um, so I hope that brings fresh life to some familiar words. Your hand, O oh God, has guided your church from age to age. did very well. Jill's going to lead us in some intercessions now. Okay, let's pray. Lord God, we come to you knowing that you are all-powerful one who created the heavens and the earth. We come knowing that nothing is impossible with you because we live in a world where we need miracles and the impossible to be possible. 
We lift before you the countries of Af Afghanistan and Haiti. We see pictures and hear stories that break our hearts. We pray for peace in Afghanistan. It seems impossible, Lord, but we know that you are greater than anything that man can do to man. We pray for Haiti that aid agencies would be able to reach and have enough for all those in need. As nations, may we pull together for the sake of our global neighbours, recognising that you, God, made and loves everybody. We pray for your world and the damage we have done to it. Lord, may we be able to change so that the effects of climate change are diminished, so that our overindulgence is not experienced by those who have little and have contributed such a tiny amount in comparison. For the many countries that have or are still experiencing wildfires, more intense, more widespread than usual, and the devastation this causes to homes, crops and livelihoods. For those who are in no doubt still trying to rebuild their lives after the severe floods not so long ago, but whom we no longer hear about in our news. Lord God, be with these people. Use our brothers and sisters in Christ to bring whatever relief they can in these places. For our country, our village, our family and friends, as we learn to live with COVID, Lord, help us to be wise with the knowledge we now have, whilst enjoying the freedoms the vaccines have given us. We thank you for the basics of food, clean water and shelter. In a small way with the pandemic, we have experienced what it is to not feel safe. May we be able to channel this in understanding how many in our world feel every day. As you make us a channel of your peace, shape us to be the people you need us to be, to share love in this broken world. We pray for those in our fellowship who need your special blessing at this time. To him is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at us at work in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So the uh, passage of scripture that uh, Andrew is going to be opening up for us this morning is found in Ephesians chapter 4 and it's the first 16 verses. As a prisoner for the Lord then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it, this is what it says. When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. And what does it mean he ascended, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching 
and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Thank God for his uh, word to us this morning. So before Andrew comes to speak to us, we're going to sing again. This is going to be Take Us to the River. And uh, it's... uh, yeah, a song that invites us to uh, meet with God and uh, reminds us of uh, uh, the, fil- the forgiveness that we need and that we receive from him. Let's sing together.
Thank you, John, and uh, thank you to the band for leading us. Uh, and it's great to be here for worship and uh, lovely to share together on this occasion. And thank you for that video clip, which I hadn't seen before until, until just now. Uh, but again, speaking powerfully into the situation of unity and about loving and about relationships within the life of the church. And as we look at uh, Ephesians here, uh, we could really do a whole study on the whole book of Ephesians. And I knew it took Calvin, I think, 49 sermons to get through, through, through uh, the, the, the book of Ephesians. Uh, we're just going to scratch the surface uh, today, uh, thinking about unity and maturity and reflecting upon that. Before uh, I speak, let's just pray. Father, we pray that you would give us ears to listen to what you're wanting to say to us today. You know how we would like church to be. And sometimes we criticize other people. Father, help us to realize we all need to play our part in order that we may become the united church you want us to be and to grow in maturity. Help us to hear what you're saying to us through your word, that we may allow you to change us and transform us so that we do indeed grow in maturity and love for one another and become the showpiece you want us to be. So we offer you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder what the four people I'm going to mention have in common. Prince Andrew, Matt Hancock, Wayne Rudy, Jeff Bezos. I'm not going to ask you to say anything, but they all have in common that they've been accused of living inconsistently with their position, with their influence upon society. In Paul's letter to the, to the Ephesians, God is trying to communicate to us, to warn us about falling into that same danger. He begins in chapter one and verse four, chapter four, verse one. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. To live lives worthy of the calling that we've received. So that we don't end up with accusations like these people I've mentioned have come under those accusations. But living a life worthy. And I'm sure we've all heard those occasions where the church has been mocked. And you've heard... Uh, people uh, uh, talking about the inconsistency of people within the life of the church. Uh, and they, they say to us, uh, it's terrible, you call yourself a Christian, and yet these things are happening within the life of the church. Or a headline is picked up from the newspaper, and the colleague says to you, I'd expect better from the Christian church. And sometimes it's hard not to have some sympathy uh, with their view. Because sadly, too often, uh, the church does not behave well. And so Paul is writing, and God is saying to us, live a life worthy so you don't come under those accusations, but so they do see an example in us. God is charging the church to strengthen Christian people to live in line with what God has already done for us. So I want to split uh, chapter 4, or the 16 verses of chapter 4, into two sections. The first section is verses 1 to 6, and the second is 7 to 16. Um, the, the first saying, this is what God has done for us. Uh, we're to live out the unity that you have in Christ because you have been made one in Christ. Uh, he's writing to Christians a very mixed bag in Ephesus and us here, a very mixed bag of people. And he says, you must actually live out your unity in Christ because you are actually one. That is what Christ has done for us. We're all different, but we've been made one in Christ. We are to live out that unity. As a prisoner of Christ, of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've re 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 heard. And the, the calling that we've heard, that, that Paul is talking about here, is not the calling to uh, move house or calling to a new job. It's a calling to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
uh, to, to, to come and to trust in him. And he's saying, we've been called to trust in him. We've put our trust in him. He's calling us as disciples of Christ to live a life worthy of him. If you're already a Christian, uh, uh, if you're here today uh, and, uh, or you're online and you're not a Christian, it's great to have you with us. Uh, there's an invitation and the calling for you is that he wants you to discover a relationship with him. him. He longs for that. The calling is for us to respond, to come into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he talks in, chapter t- t- in, in this chapter uh, about being filled with Christ and becoming the people God wants us to be. In, in the first three chapters of Ephesians, he's gone, gone through a lot of theology. And in chapter 3, he talks about being filled with the full measure of the fullness of Christ. And he says, in chapter 3, verse 10, God's intent was that now through the church, through us, through the church, the wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Through us, that's an incredible saying. God is saying he wants to make his plan known through his church. How incredible is that? His plan to the heavenly range, to the good and the evil in the world. He wants us to be making that known. Uh, There are new developments, housing developments here in Capel. Uh, The one in Saxon Meadow is virtually complete. They had a show home that's now been sold. Uh, there's a new development of Little Tufts called Sanford Gardens, and the show house, I believe, is now open. The show house is for people to go and visit to see what the development is going to be like, the quality of the build, the space that's there. It's meant to be shown that. And what Paul is saying in this letter, what God is saying to us through this letter, is that the church is the showpiece for the world of what the relationship with Jesus Christ is is like. For he says, God's intent was that now, through the church, the wisdom of God should be made known to rulers and the heavenly realms. God reveals his plan for the universe to the spiritual forces of good and evil through the church. In other words, we are on show. The likes of us are to be showing to the world what Jesus is like. The prayer that uh, was part of the video that uh, John shared was, was, was saying that we should be one as he and the Father are one. And, and we're on show to the world. And it's our unity that will speak to the world. And in John's Gospel, he says, the world will know we're his disciples by our love for one another, the unity that God brings to us. God has made us one, and he wants for us to show that to the world. That makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable, because that's a real challenge. We're not as united as we should be to put on that face that this is what God's plan is for the world, to have that unity that should be in us. The church is a gathering of Christians. It's a show home of God's final purpose of where God's will people will be through the ages as we're all gathered together. And that's part of our calling, to be part of that, showing God's plan to the world. And it's interesting, in verse 3 uh, of this passage, he says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. He doesn't say, make every effort uh, to, 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 to create some kind of unity yourselves. It's already there. It's given in Jesus Christ to keep the unity. There have been lots of structures towards uh, having united churches and things like that. Actually, in Christ, we are one. And that's what Paul is saying. And he longs for us to begin to experience that and to see that as a reality. We're called together not to create, but to keep that unity of the Spirit. That we actually are already one in Christ. You've got to live in a way that reflects that. 
to keep in a place with what God has already done for us. So there in Ephesus and here in Cape Port, a diverse group of people with different social, social backgrounds, different nationalities, different preferences, different personality types, different views on various aspects of Christian living, Christ has actually made us one. And the word one appears so many times now in the next few verses. One body, one family, one building, one people. And so we've got to live that out. What does it mean to live as one? Our unity is based on the fact that we're all trusting the one Lord Jesus Christ. And our final hymn we'll talk about, the church's one foundation, is Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the one that holds us together. And Paul goes on to say that the one key thing that brings about that unity is humility. In that verse 3, make every effort, uh, oh sorry, be completely humble, be gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Be completely humble. It's interesting that Paul uses the word completely humble. Uh, We're often a little humble. We can be pretend humble. And Paul knows that. We can often pretend. We can put on a church face and a church behavior. But actually what happens the rest of the week is vitally important. And that's what other people see. He says, be completely humble humble. Uh, He knows how easy it is to be just partially humble. And here in Ephesus and and here in Capel, um, there's a variety of different people. In Ephesus, there was Jew, there was Gentile, there was slave, there was free. There were lots of different uh, people, male and female, all those different things. Uh, But without Christ, we are nothing. It is trusting in the one Lord Jesus Christ that brings about that unity. But it's so easy to compare ourselves with other people. And uh, we look around and we think, well, I'm a little bit higher up the rung and the ladder than this other person. And that's what that video at the beginning was just challenging, challenging us about. Our attitudes towards others, being completely humble, is seeing ourselves as God sees us. And being in that right relationship with him, that we recognize that we're nothing without him. And that's so for everyone else in Jesus Christ. Nothing without him, but together we are being made one by him. John Calvin, in one of those sermons uh, that he preached, uh, said, people who think of themselves a lot and think little of others become very unsociable. They become aloof from others. If we're just thinking about self and where we are on the rung and the ladder, we're not being completely humble. We're comparing ourselves with others and we want to put others down and lift ourselves up. We can become very unsociable, but the church is meant to be showing unity and showing love. You are all one. And uh, he uses other words to describe not just the humble. He talks about being gentle, being patient, bearing with one another. That means you don't fly off the handle. Uh, You make every effort. It doesn't come naturally. It has to be worked at. So make every effort to keep the bond of peace, to love one another, and to become what God wants us to be. And so he goes on to describe what it is to be one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and through all. There is our unity in Christ. The church is one foundation. And it's why we use the word we and not me, and why in the Lord's Prayer we don't say my Father, we say our Father. It's because together we're in relationship with one another, being God's plan to make himself known to the world through his church. Uh, what an awesome responsibility. And so the second part, and uh, time's ready to run out of me now, is the growth in maturity. What would a mature church look like? Maybe a lot of uh, senior saints who've been around for decades, or lots of people who behave very well. 
um, uh, or a, a Bible teaching church that's mature. Those are lots of different ways. What does verse 13 say? Verse 13 says, until we all reach the unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the full measure of the fullness of God. It's back to that fullness of God. It's being filled full of God and allowing him to do that. It's that relationship with God that brings that maturity. Are we growing in maturity? In Ephesians chapter 1, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 23, Paul has already described the church as the, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And in the passage just before the reading today, from the end of uh, chapter 3, where there's a, a lovely prayer which I preached on before, uh, he says uh, that you may be filled, he prays that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. In other words, to grow in maturity with what Christ has already secured for us. And he goes on to describe this maturity is each one playing their part. Verse 7, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned. Again, from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. But only, my words, as each does his part. It's only as each of us plays our part. To grow up uh, in, in, in Christ is, is, is to each of us playing our part within the body of Christ locally. And what is our part? Well, we're gifted by God, and uh, it talks about particular gifts here. It talks about people gifts uh, of apostles, prophets, pastors, uh, teachers, evangelists. Uh, it talks about those here, but there's so many more gifts that he gives to all of us. And each of us is to play our part. And I wonder what your vision of a, vision of a church is. Is, is. is it a concert? One person at the front who's very gifted musically, uh, and doing some beautiful music at the front, and all of us at the end then applauding? Or is it more like a, a football match where there are more involved, a whole team involved, and are playing together, but again, there are many supporters there, often shouting from the bylines, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, you should be doing this, that, and the other, uh, particularly if it's Itzhut's it's town. Um, uh, is it a football match? Or is it a battleship? where you've got a crew, and we are the crew, and everyone has a job to do. I think next week Paul is going to get on to, um, or someone's doing, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, which is talking about the spiritual warfare and about work, working together. Each of us playing a part. A battleship, everyone is playing a part. And that's what we're called to be. Uh, if one is not playing their part, something doesn't work properly, and there's an accident or something goes wrong. We're not passengers, we're not spectators, we're not, a con we're not uh, concert goers, we're participants in the body of Christ, each of us gifted to do something. To grow into maturity is for each of us to play our part that we may become what God calls us to be. Are we open to the part that God has for us? Are we willing to serve and to bless one another? And are we willing to have that right attitude towards one another, knowing where we are in relationship to God, what he has done for us, and recognize a brother, a sister in Christ. He may have different views on a variety of different things. He may behave in a different way to the way I behave. But we're not meant to be clones. There is diversity in what, what God has given. He's given variety of gifts, not all the same. And he longs for us to work each of us to play our part that we may become what God wants us to be. Let's just be quiet a moment. Father, thank you for your word and for this uh, word in Ephesians that is, is just saying what you have done for us and how we're to live in the light of what you've done for us. Thank you for that unity that is in Christ. We have one Saviour. We have one Lord and even one baptism, a variety of different ways in which baptism has taken place. But one baptism. It's one relationship with Jesus Christ. But each of us 
is called to play our part in the body of Christ. May we grow in maturity and become what you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we close with the hymn, The Church's One Foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. prayer for the Ephesians, Paul, prayer for us. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>